painting in the Netherlands in the 17th century seems to have had a preoccupation with surface reality. Sometimes with the painted surface of the paint, sometimes smooth, sometimes rough. Always preoccupied with the illusion that these paintings are realistic. But actually, reality always has something working beneath the surface. And the Baroque, right from its origins, always made choices about which reality to show, which religion, which country, and which people. On the 31st of October 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 disputations against indulgences to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany, beginning the Protestant Reformation of the Church. In 1536, Jean Calvin of Geneva published his Institutes, which would give rise to the Calvinist Church, which would come to be the largest Protestant church in the northern Netherlands. The Catholic Church reacted to the rise in Protestantism by defining its position through the Council of Trent, set up by Pope Paul III and running from 1543 until 1563. Among the issues defined was the Church's position on art, ultimately a reaffirmation of the 8th century Council of Nicaea's praise of art as a vehicle for education and worship. The Tridentine call for simplicity, realism and emotion in art resulted in the Baroque era and in its earliest stages in the work of Michelangelo Merisa de Caravaggio whose chiaroscuro technique with contrasting light and darkness influenced several Utrecht painters who travelled to Italy, among them Gerard van Honthorst. Also Honthorst has adopted Caravaggio's technique of using hands and lines of vision to guide the viewer around the narrative. The Netherlands had passed to the control of the Habsburgs in 1492 and the Spanish Habsburgs in 1556. Philip II ruled in absentia, but through his regent, Margaret of Parma, and her advisor, Cardinal Granvelle, fiercely punished any signs of the Protestant heresy. Desire for spiritual independence brought the Bildenstorm, or great iconoclasm, from 1566 onwards and desire for political and economic freedom from Spain brought the revolt of the 17 provinces and the beginning of the 80 years war of independence. Thanks to the fact that Philip II's general, the Duke of Alba, had garrisoned his troops close to the French border to prevent invasion, the seven northern provinces were able to achieve independence from 1581 onwards, with members of the House of Orange ruling a Stadthudus, except for the 22-year regency. In reality, the Eighty Years' War was in fact a war of independence until the Twelve-Year Truce of 1609, which brought de facto recognition of the United Northern Netherlands, after which the whole of Europe was engulfed in the Thirty Years' War, an extension of the religious wars of the 16th century. As R. H. Fuchs points out in this extract from his monograph, Dutch Painting, the new urban merchant class became the new patrons of art, but buying from a free art market rather than through commission, radically altering the way in which the artist's studio worked. However, there needs to be a nuanced view of this dichotomy between Flemish art of the Catholic South, as epitomised by the works of Rubens, and the art of the Protestant North, encapsulated in the oeuvre of Vermeer. Vermeer was a Catholic, while Rubens was raised a Protestant before his mother converted out of expediency. There are numerous examples of other artists who do not tidily fit the Catholic South Northern Protestant model. As Festerman points out, Calvinism was not consistently the majority religion. Also, it should be mentioned that the ruling aristocratic patrons of the North, the House of Orange, favoured the style predominant in the Catholic South for decoration of their palaces, 
as is evidenced by the choice of the southern Flemish artist Jacob Jordaens for the decoration in the Oranje Zaal in Hustenbosch, a palace of the Stadhuda Frederick Henry, which his wife decorated in a glorification of her late husband after his death in 1647. Dutch Baroque art then is characterized by its complexity, with a proliferation of genre and schools largely focused on various urban centers of production and with various degrees of association with or dissociation from Calvinism. Pieter Sandrydam's works seemingly epitomize Dutch Calvinism by depicting churches purged of all sculpture and painting and in great naturalistic detail and perspectival precision. But as comparison with saint Redam's earlier sketch of St. Bavo's church in Haarlem shows, the later painting shows subtle adjustments in the reality of the church. A pulpit not included in the sketch is foregrounded in the painting as a symbol of the Calvinist focus on the presentation of the text of the Bible in oration. Hence the realities of Dutch painting should be examined and deconstructed as a representation of the worldviews of Dutch patrons. One very popular genre painter from Leiden was the Catholic Jan Steen, who specialised in paintings with moral homilies, which would have been popular with middle class patrons. In this work, the empty purse which hangs above the matriarch is the result of her failings in the running of the household, and the cause of these failings is the cause of her deep sleep, the evil of alcohol. The placard on the lower right of the picture gives the work its title. In Vilde Sit Tol, which translates as Beware of Luxury. The details of the painting from 1653 are represented with great verisimilitude, but the realities depicted are not realistic ones. Firstly, the clothes of some of the protagonists are unrealistic extremes for a Dutch household, veering from the overly puritanistic to the bawdiness of a brothel or tavern worker. Similarly, the presence of animals such as a monkey, pig or duck would not be expected in a Dutch household. The alcohol-induced sleep of the matriarch has allowed extreme behaviour of theft and the evil of smoking by the children of the house and open, tipsy flirting by the younger adults. These more obvious illustrations are also accompanied by illustrations of proverbs that would have been known to a contemporary Dutch audience. The monkey stopping the clock would have reminded viewers of the proverb saying that in folly time is forgotten. The dog licking food is a reference to poorly raised children. The pig which has run off with a tap to the barrel on the left represents the idea of drinking to excess. Likewise the quacking duck represents gibberish. Roses before the swine was a proverb about wastefulness. However all of these errors have their future consequences. They hang above the protagonists like the sword of Damocles in a basket, crutches and a leper's rattle representing illness and the lash representing punishment. A similar work by Stein contains the proverb so the oude songe, so pieper the jonge or as the old sing, so pipe the young stressing the catastrophic impact of bad modelling by adults with regards alcohol and tobacco, among other evils. More explicitly, this work, The Morning Toilet, which shows a lady getting dressed, contains various symbols for the image to be understood by. The framing device of the lute is a conventional symbol of a vanitas, a moral warning against the insignificant world of the flesh which passes. However, the candle and open jewel box refer to the proverb that one does not buy pearls in the dark or look for love at night. Hence, the stocking which the lady is putting on, in Dutch, a koos, a word which also referred to female genitalia, marks the female as a prostitute and refers the viewer back to the vanity of the sins of the flesh. This unusual work by Stein from 1665, entitled The Life of Man, shows people enjoying life with the aid of the aphrodisiac of oysters, showing oysters being prepared, eaten, 
enjoyed with music, or being employed in seduction. However, hidden in an attic is an image of a boy blowing a bubble, next to a skull and a golden cage, all vanitas emblems of the brevity or futility of the earthly life of the senses. Interestingly, Stain's painting is included as the target of this invective, the cleverly illusionistic cloth covering the work as well as giving the idea of a revelation of the theatre of life, is a reference to the story of the artistic contest between Xeuxis and Parhasius in ancient Greece, which the latter artist won by painting an illusionistic covering and inviting the other artist to reveal the work. One of the things the people in Stain's painting are enjoying is the centrally placed painting, representing art as a vanitas. Another work by Stein, this one from the Wallace collection, called Celebrating the Birth, contains an image which had been overpainted in order to conceal the bawdy message of Stein's original work. Despite the bedpan representing a sexless marriage, along with the imagery representing the male genitalia, such as the maid handling a sausage, and representing female genitalia with the eggshells littering the floor, the work was considered in the absence of the overpainted clue, merely to be a celebration of a birth. But the two fingers held up by the man behind the father, denoting the latter as a cuckold, were only rediscovered in a cleaning in 1983. Pieter de Hoek's immaculately depicted interiors and exteriors represent a more positive model of Dutch society, showing tidy streets or rooms with the Dutch Republic citizens engaged in constructive work such as spinning or changing the carefully stored linen. Simon Sharma's An Embarrassment of Riches refers to the importance of the Dutch Navy, originally in forging the independence of the country through military victories and in allowing global exploration and colonization and enriching the Republic through overseas trade routes. The aristocratic Stadtholders had supported the Stuarts and Cromwell's execution of the king, along with competition for trade and territory in the East Indies and the Americas, led to war in 1652, and after the Restoration in 1665, and again in 1675, all largely carried out at sea. The Dutch merchant fleet was the largest in the world, owing to a system of share trading in joint stock companies to finance overseas exploration and trade missions. Sharma also talks about how seascapes took on a moral dimension, referring to contemporary fiction which emphasises submission to the will of God on storm-tossed seas. This moral interpretation of nature permeated Dutch landscape painting. Both the statesman and author Jakob Katz and Constantine Huygens, the poet and secretary to Frederick Henry and then William II, wrote of the moral presence of God in nature and Huygens himself often sketched landscapes. Hendrik Averkamp was a deaf mute, and his work represents a pivotal stage in Dutch painting, influenced as he was by Flemish mannerism and the winter landscapes of Brochel the Elder, particularly this one made famous by Brochel's son's copies. Averkamp used his heightened sense of the visual, not allowing his disability to prevent him from training as a painter. Avakamp often painted skaters gliding noiselessly through the landscape, detachedly observing vignettes of the contemporary Dutch world. Death, life, art, scatology, work, play, poverty, and riches and love. Dutch Golden Age landscape painting is traditionally divided into three partly overlapping phases, tonal, classical and Italianate, as Dutch Baroque paintings of outdoor views emerged as a genre distinct from the landscape style of the previous century, whilst adapting Baroque treatment of space to its unique landscapes, before the end of the Thirty Years' War allowed a more tolerant attitude towards Mediterranean landscapes. Early tonal landscape works, in contrast 
to the exaggerated colouring, content, style and terrain of mannerist landscapes, such as those of Roland Savary, used a more naturalistic, muted tonality, favouring earth tones. This flattening of tones can be seen in the extreme in the works of Esaias van der Velde, in this view of Sierxi from 1618, in which the artist has attempted to record the view without embellishment, in the spirit of Nachhet Lefen, or painted from life. Pieter de Molin's works, whilst retaining the calmness of Esaias van der Velde's, introduces a sense of contrasting light and shadow to the landscape. Jan van Goyen, the Leiden-born Harlem-trained student of Isaias van der Velde, settled in The Hague and produced a huge oeuvre. This work of the Dunes at Scheveningen, despite its emphasis on muted tonality, is not painted purely in the spirit of Nachet Leven, or painted from life, but also comes out of the imagination, Ut den Gist. Comparison of Van Goyen's sketch shows that he has increased the size of the dunes by reducing the size of the figures on them and at their base. Van Goyen, interestingly, was caught up in the tulip madness of 1637, buying, on the eve of the crash, ten bulbs in exchange for 1,900 florins, a Salomon van Rijsdale painting, and his own painting of Judas. Van Goyen never recovered financially and died insolvent in 1656. Jakob van Rijsdale's windmill at Wikbiderstedt belongs to the classical phase of Dutch Baroque landscape, in which the landscape takes on an elemental force, dispelling the calm repose of the earlier tonal works. The clouds which drive the windmill, a Dutch national symbol, rise to great arching heights, and the deliberately low horizon emphasises the mill and the sky, whilst the contrasting light emphasises the wind and a sense of movement and change. The windmill represented either the potential to feed the Dutch nation or to reclaim land from the sea through perpetual drainage, a symbol of the Dutch nation's struggle to create itself. The art historians J. R. Martin and Germain Bazin both speak of the Baroque as being influenced by the post-Copernican universe, in which Aquinas's project to find God in creation received an impetus from Copernicus's discovery of an infinite universe. Accordingly, Baroque art is imbued with a sense of infinite space, either in ceiling depictions of the heavens and also in the classical phase of Dutch Baroque landscape. And similarly, Hobbema's Avenue at Middlemass has this sense of an emphasised vanishing point and a low horizon and tall trees to exaggerate the sense of space. Albert Kuyp here has a sense of southern light and handling of tone in the clouds which preludes the later classical phase in Dutch landscape, but the subject matter of the windmill and the Valkhof are quintessentially Dutch national symbols. <laughs>